So this is the, the topic of my talk is about privacy and anonymity in trust negotiation systems. I'm, I'm, I actually come from University of Milan. I've been doing my PhD with Professor Bettino, maybe you already know her. And this is part of my PhD topic. So let me start with a, a brief outline on, on, on the talk. First, I will uh, give, give, some, um, give an overview about the trust negotiation models for, the, for those of you who are not familiar with the model. Then I will uh, introduce you to the, the framework we've, we've been working on, which is called TrustKey, and it's an XML-based framework for uh, supporting and achieving trust negotiations. The framework is basically composed of uh, different components, and one of them is the language, which we call XTNL, and and the frame and the and architecture, uh, and some and also some uh, strategies and protocols to carry out negotiations. Then I will focus on the main uh, aspects, on the main innovative aspects and features of, of our framework, which deal with the privacy and anonymity. First, some, some uh, introduction on why privacy is an issue in trust negotiations, and then some of the solutions that we came up with uh, in our framework. The same approach will be followed when I will talk about uh, anonymity techniques for trust negotiation, why anonymity is an important issue in trust negotiations, and which are the solutions we came up with. Then, if I have time, I spend a few words on some recovery protocols of our trust negotiation systems. So, but let me start with the a few words on what a trust negotiation is. So trust negotiations is, a, is a, an authorization approach for open system where most of the interactions occur between strangers. So the idea of a trust negotiation is to establish trust online between two parties in order to exchange sensitive information on resources. The trust negotiation model by itself is, very, is a general purpose model. So it's not targeted for any specific uh, resource or service. It's just a, an authorization model that can be applied in different scenarios. So in the, um, one of the main features of uh, trust negotiation is that uh, trust is established online and uh, it's based on the properties of the users. There are usually two parties involved and um, uh, the, uh, the trust and, and the properties are, um, are, are exchanged through the use of credentials. Where digital credentials are uh, uh, digitally signed document issued by offline authorities before the, te the, the negotiation can take place. So another uh, in interesting approach, uh, an interesting feature of the trust negotiation is that it, um, the credentials can be protected as well as other, any other resources through, 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 through policies. So the idea is that there are some policies which can protect either the, the services or the credentials that, that each party possesses. So the, the framework which we have developed, it's called Trustix, and as I said earlier, it's an XML-based framework. So uh, all, the secu the, all the information that are exchanged are, uh, are encoded using, X X using XML. So the, we have first, we, we first design an, an ad hoc language for negotiations, which is called XTNL. And then we also devised a, a several algorithms and strategies to carry out the negotiation, taking into account the different aspects that the, that the, the negotiating parties that might be interested in. So we take into, took into account uh, privacy and anonymity issues. We also considered the, the efficiency of the protocols. And we tried to make some integration of the of our system with the existing standard standards for privacy. We also have a system architecture since we did implement the framework to experiment and evaluate whether or not the, the language was flexible enough, or was expressive enough, and also whether the strategies were uh, as efficient and uh, as promising, as, um, and, as were as efficient as we thought. So first, some few words about the, the language. So, uh, there are two main building blocks in the, in, in the external language. First, the, creden the certificates and then the, um, the policies. About the, the, the certificates, we distinguish between uh, credentials and declarations. So credentials are, um, uh, are um, as I said earlier, are digitally, do digitally signed documents issued by offline authorities. And in our specific language, 
uh, these uh, credentials are encoded using uh, XML, and precisely every credential is an, is an instance of uh, is an instance of a DTD uh, is an instance of a of a DTD document, which means that it's a valid document and it's conform uh, to to the to the document type definition. This enables a, a, a typing system so that every credential is actually conforming to a specific type. And the credential collects a bunch of uh, attributes uh, um, referring to uh, a specific uh, aspect or topic of the holder. An example of a credential might be, for instance, uh, a, digital, uh, a digital driving license, a digital pass passport, or so forth. And declarations are very similar to credentials. The main difference is that the, they are self-signed, which means that it's the holder itself that issues and creates these credentials. And, um, and they collect this kind, the, all those kind of information that are not really required, that, do not re, do, that are not really required to be signed by any other, any other party, but, they might, but which might anyhow be useful during the negotiation. So another aspect that we, we, we took into account in our language uh, is about the collection and the management of all the credentials. The idea is that every subject that is in every negotiating party has its own uh, collection of credentials. So we have this concept of X profile, which is basically a, coll a credential collector, and it's further organized into data set, where data sets are basically uh, credential collector credential and declaration collector uh, referring to the same aspect of the life of the of the life of the owner or the, of the of the of the of the party so as i said um, besides the collection the credential management and collection we also defined uh, we also defined uh, our notion of disclosure policy disclosure policy are basically expressed by means of credential combinations that can be used to obtain authorization. And uh, disclosure policies are specified both for, uh, for protecting services as well as uh, credential they themselves. So we encode disclosure policies in uh, XML as well as the credentials, but we use this uh, simple formalism to, for, to, to, to describe our algorithms. So the idea is, for instance, in this, in this example, we have that the name of a certificate uh, with two brackets and another name of certificates with the specified conditions. The understanding here is that if there is no bracket, uh, the certificate itself is, is uh, needed as a whole, as a proof of possession, and instead if there are some conditions in the certificate, uh, in, in the bracket, it means that uh, on the certificate some, some specific um, conditions have to be checked. So trust, specifying trust negotiation policies, however, is not as trivial as it might seem because um, usually uh, um, not, uh, there is, a, there is a, an underlying uh, implication on, the, on this type of encoding, uh, on, this, on this type of encoding uh, disclosure policies. We are assuming that uh, every, uh, every negotiation party already knows all the, the, the credential types that are available, and also that he has to specify manually all the equivalent or similar disclosure policies. So for instance, if I need to know just a, a specific condition, that condition can be checked on different credentials. So the idea is that the, 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 the policy writer has to specify all these, poli all these uh, different and equivalent disclosure policies to be disclosed during the negotiation as an alternative. In addition to this, we have the, the credential types. They do provide a syntactic structure, so they work, they work well for, um, for uh, helping the, the trust negotiation software to reference to similar credentials, but do not specify anything about the interpretation of, these attribute, of the, the attributes in the credentials. So there is nothing really about the semantic of the, uh, about, there's nothing really about the semantic of the, of the credentials. So to overcome these issues, we introduced the notion of ontology in trust negotiations. So the lack of this semantic in credential and attributes, in addition, makes it impossible to automatically detect relationship between different credentials. So there are some attributes that are, as I said earlier, they are really equivalent with one another. So the name in a passport is the name as the name in an ID card. But if we only have 
this uh, typing system, we don't have any underlying semantic. We, cannot, uh, we can't automatically detect any relationship between these different attributes. So we, for this was the main reason for introducing ontologies. The ontologies provide a formal specification for concept and uh, also give, a, give, an, a, give a, a semantic of the possible interrelationship between different concepts. In the trust negotiation environment, using ontologies means uh, associating, uh, uh, to, associating to the different attributes in, a, in, dif in the different credential a given concept. So a concept in, a, in, our, in, our, in our ontology is described as following. It is, a, it is given by a tuple, and we have a set of keywords and a set of attributes. The set of keywords are, are in English words just expressing a given concept, and they are one uh, synonymous of another. And the lang set instead is the collection of the attributes that all implement the same concept. We make, of course, of course, we can we can have um, different attributes and different credentials, which are uh, equi semantically equivalent, but they are defined over different domains. So for this reason, we make use of a, a translation function to compare the values of two semantically equivalent attribute conditions. We assume, of course, that our ontology is well defined, which means that there are no overlapping concepts, and the concepts are all organized using a generalization or specialization interrelationships. Uh, so, using uh, having a, a property-based policy, uh, sorry, having a, having a, an ontology allows us to define policies at a higher level, at a more abstract level. So, we can define the, the policy not in terms of the specific credential, but we can define uh, policies in terms, of, in terms of properties. So we can have uh, this notion of property-based policy. A property-based policy is basically um, a policy expressed in terms of specific, pro uh, specific properties, and the properties are specified using the, the keywords of the ontologies so that we can automatically translate a property-based policy expressed like this one in, in a corresponding um, disclosure policy specified in terms of specific, uh, uh, specific uh, attributes and certificates. So we map the marital status um, condition uh, property into a certificate. We map the condition of the country being equal to use to USA into uh, a specific uh, credential and the condition against a, a, an attribute of that credential. So um, this concept of disclosure sets is needed to, for our algorithms on uh, privacy and uh, anonymity. A disclosure set is basically the, the response to a given property-based policy or to a given uh, disclosure policy. A disclosure set is basically a set of attributes or credentials aiming at satisfying a given policy or a, a property-based policy. Uh, it will contain two kinds of attributes. Requested and non-requested ones. Requested are, are, are attributes that are explicitly mentioned in the policy, and non-requested ones are instead um, attributes that are present in the disclosure policy, but they're not explicitly mentioned in the policy. And we might need to have them. Um, we might have them because, uh, as I said, the, the, the credential is not only collecting one single one single attribute, but it has a bunch of attributes. And in order to have the, that attribute disclosed, we need to disclose the whole credential. So the example of uh, referring to the previous uh, policy, this is the, uh, an example of a very simple example of a disclosure set. So the trust negotiation system uh, is, uh, is organized as follows. We have different components, and the main components are the X profile that I mentioned earlier for collecting the, for collecting the certificates and credentials, certificates and, um, which are credential and declaration. We have a policy database collecting the disclosure policy or the property-based policy. We have a compliance checker for checking, uh, uh, for checking policy satisfaction and for retrieving uh, a remote, uh, uh, remote or local credential from the, X pro, uh, the, from the X profile. And we have a tree manager, which is a data structure uh, um, for, for keeping track of the state of the negotiation. Here, the focus here is that 
or oh, every every negotiation part every nego negotiating part is also is always equipped with the same uh, uh, with the same architecture which means that we just with the same uh, system which means that the the system is peer to peer and uh, a same part in a negotiation may act as a as a as a as a server as a as a requester a service requester and in the following negotiation it might act as a as a as a requester in the how does a trust negotiation work in our model so we have organized the trust negotiation into three different phases one first phase is called the introductory phase and it's basically the beginning of the negotiation when the first request is sent from one side to another and some possible introductory policy are exchanged we have then this policy evaluation phase uh, which is um, uh, which is used for uh, exchanging policies and uh, to define a set of uh, to define a set of credentials which have to be disclosed in order to satisfy in order to satisfy the uh, initial request the, in, the initial request so the idea is to establish a certain level of trust through this uh, disclosure of policy and once all this policy can be can be satisfied then the certificates the actual certificates uh, disclosure can take place. So, having given now some background on what what is our Trusty, what is our how is our Trusty framework is organized, I can go into the detail of this of the privacy issues and the privacy solutions that we have uh, devised. So, there are several issues related with privacy in trust negotiations since trust negotiation by its nature it uh, involves the disclosure of different uh, uh, of different kind of information and most of them are, are sensitive or or private because they are personal of the of the trust negotiation party first in trust ne trust negotiation does not uh, give any hint does not control or safeguard personal information once this has been disclosed Further, there are during the policy evaluation phase, there is no actual credential disclosure. Since we want to protect disclosures as, uh, as soon as, we, as much as we can, we postpone them at the end of the negotiations, which means that during the negotiation phase, uh, an attacker may, be, may, may lie and say, claim possession of credentials, which it doesn't actually have. So, um, as a result, the, some sensitive information can be inferred from a response to a request. Um, to access a resource, so some information can be inferred without having without even having to disclose the actual credential. And further, if the some of the policy themselves may may be may, may require to be protected as resources, and there is no actual protection during the policy evaluation phase for the policies for the policies themselves. Other other privacy threats are related to the fact that um, are related to the fact that um, that a credential may contain sensitive several sensitive attributes and some of them are are really not required for sat satisfying a policy. Sometimes you really just need one piece of information. There is a uh, one piece of the. Um, of the credential, one or a couple of attributes, uh, while the, the the credential collects the whole. Uh, a whole set of uh, attributes, but in order to verify the digital signature and to, to prove the honesty and the correctness of the of the credential, you need you have to disclose the whole credential. So, which were the, um, the solutions we came up with? First, we redefined the notion of policy and we extended again, uh, not only with the property-based policy, but with new features. Then we redefine the, the notion of credential and we develop some strategies. Le we also did some, we also in, uh, began this integration with the P3P platform, which is the current standard in terms of privacy for um, web-based resources. So regarding the, the policy, we introduced the notion of policy preconditions, which means that one disclosure policy is a precondition of another one, so that uh, uh, one policy can be disclosed and can be can be open only if uh, this precondition is satisfied. We regarding instead, and we also introduced this notion of policy context, which I just mentioned here, um, which is used to express privacy policy, better to attach privacy policy to disclosure policy. 
and we are um, to associate uh, par policy precondition and to convey some other information which might be used uh, to speed up the process. Regarding instead the, um, the, the credential, we reorganize the structure of, uh, of the credential since Every credential beyond the specific, uh, every credential beyond the specific uh, content and the specific type, uh, it always collects uh, some reference information about the credential related with the type, the issue, and the temporary validity. We pull up all this information in what we call an either, and we separate it from the actual content of the credential. And additionally, what we did is, is to apply some hash functions on the credential content so that the actual content of the credential can be blinded. We compute the, the, the signature over the whole credential, hashed, the hashed credential, so that uh, the, the credential either can be disclosed plain and uh, while the credential content can be, can be left blinded at first release. And uh, we, can, we, ha we have this notion of credential proof. For us, for us, the credential proof is basically uh, the disclosure of the header leaving the, uh, leaving the, the whole co content hidden. Uh, and having this kind of uh, having this kind of uh, stru structure for a credential enables us to have new approaches for uh, disclosing information during the credential. So we can either gradually disclose the credential first, the either, and then the attributes during the during the credential exchange phase, or we can also immediately uh, release the, the attributes as soon as they are involved in the process. And I go more into the detail of this aspect when I go when I explain the the strategies. So this is unreadable. I know that. So. This is an example. I want to just to give an example of, uh, um, of, of, a, of an actual credential. So there are different parts. There is just the, to make it more clear. So we have the header, which is the which collects the credential type, an ID, the, ref, the issue, the reference of the issues, the expiration date. Then we have the content. Here it is an example of a hidden content, so it's just an hash, va an hash value. There's no hint about the na neither the name of the attributes nor the value. And then we have some fields for the signature. Okay, uh, now going into the detail of the strategies, trust negotiations can be carried out uh, uh, according to several strategies, which are referred to as strategies. There are different uh, uh, definition of for strategies in trust, ne in, trust, in trust negotiation literature. The understanding that we have of trust negotiation literature, uh, of trust negotiation strategies, is just that it is an approach for, uh, for, for a negotiation party um, to, adopt, uh, to, to be adopted during the negotiation. Uh, the language tools that we have in trustees are the basis upon which a number of different strategies can be adopted to better trade off between uh, uh, different requirements like uh, privacy or, or efficiency uh, and so forth. So the trust negotiation strategies that we have are, are, are listed here and um, a few words on each of them. The standard strategies basically reflect uh, uh, reflects the first sketch that I give, gave about the protocol of the negotiation. So first we have this introductory phase, a policy evaluation phase, and finally the, and finally the credential exchange phase, where the, the credentials involved in the policy evaluation phase are exchanged. The suspicious uh, strategies instead is, um, makes use of the credential schema that we have devised. So the idea is to disclose the credential either as soon as the, uh, the credential is involved in the trust negotiation process, which means that during the policy evaluation phase, I, I already dis uh, disclose the header. And then the content of the credential is actually revealed during the, during the um, credential exchange phase. The strongest suspicious strategy is instead uh, a specific case of the suspicious strategies where uh, the attributes are actually disclosed immediately or better, as soon as they are involved in the process and their policy is satisfied, which means that uh, during the policy evaluation phase, as soon as the cred uh, an attribute can be released because its policy is satisfied, then it's, it's released to the counterpart. The trusting strategy is, a strategy, is a, instead a strategy characterized by having one of the two parties uh, suggesting uh, 
some um, suggesting uh, some policies to be some some following messages around so that um, some of the negotiation round can be skipped and finally a mixed strategies uh, a mixed strategy is basically uh, a, mi uh, a combination of the above strategies mixed uh, uh, that can be used during the same negotiation and the same party can switch from one strategy to another during the negotiation process so we have implemented and tested all these strategies to, 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 for evaluating the correctness and the measuring the, the computational complexity of each of them. And here, just a sketch of the, um, of the test cases that we considered. We have some cases for evaluated, uh, for evaluated the upfront disclosure of the credential proof. And um, other cases have been considered instead for testing uh, uh, specific features of the language and of the system. So, uh, for instance, uh, to consider whether with the cases when uh, there are policies are recursive, which means that one policy calls, in chad, uh, calls another, and uh, to, to, to test other specific uh, features of the language, like uh, terms of um, attribute condition of a specific format and so forth. So this is, these are the main results that we got. And uh, as expected, the suspicious and the strongest suspicious strategies are the one on the, to on the top of the graph, the purple and the yellow one, and they are the most uh, expensive in terms of time because there are, um, although the final, although with, the, with both these strategies, uh, the credential exchange phase is very short, the policy evaluation phase requires a number of uh, additional checks and operations to be performed. And the overall, uh, time is, uh, is greater than, um, than if we execute the negotiation with, dif with the standard strategies. Uh, the standard strategy is the blue one, and this is one of the shortest, and, but the shortest is, of, is the mix, is the trusting. And I didn't really go, in, went to go into the detail of the trusting strategy because it's not really related with, the, uh, with, pri with the privacy. It's, it's just a way in case, it's just a way to model neg the negotiation in case one of the two parties uh, is, for instance, a server and they can somehow drive the negotiation. And if one of the party can uh, drive the negotiation and can, uh, um, can speed up the negotiation, of course, the overall time for the process is uh, shorter. So the other um, solution that I mentioned earlier for, the, for dealing with privacy was about the, introdu the, introdu the introduction of, pri of P3P privacy policy in trust key negotiations. So what we did was the following. Having the, the, the basic uh, trust negotiation protocol, and this is the same slide as I showed earlier, so the same flow, introductory policy evaluation and certificate exchange phase, we added uh, and uh, during the introductory phase, we had this privacy agreement subphase with the aim of um, uh, reaching a first agreement on the, on the privacy practices that the parties will um, have during the policy evaluation phase and their certificate exchange phase. And, in, uh, and uh, it actually consists of uh, exchanging very coarse grain the privacy policy, just stating, uh, how, just stating how the next information to be disclosed will be, will be managed and collected. And in case some um, specific privacy policies have to, be, um, have to be applied, we also give the possibility of, uh, we also give the parties the possibility of attaching uh, specific privacy policies uh, to uh, some of the exchanged policy. So if there is a credential which actually requires uh, some specific privacy practices, for instance, related with the collection of the data, of the re or, or the retention, then we can attach some uh, specific privacy uh, privacy policy. So the the, the privacy enable, enabled trust negotiation will have uh, will follow the say uh, the this flow. We'll have this introductory phase, and during the introductory phase, some additional exchange are required for the privacy agreement subphase, and during the policy evaluation phase. Uh, the, disclosure, the disclosure policy exchange can, uh, can, be, can be executed together with uh, some uh, P3P policy exchange, uh, which are uh, targeted for the exchange of the creden uh, credential information. So about, uh, uh, about the issue of anonymity. 
Uh, our work in anonymity started, of course, with uh, some questions or some, um, some questions about how and whether anonymity is actually an issue in, uh, in the trust negotiation context. So since the trust negotiation is, as I said at the beginning, is very general and it can be applied in different scenarios, it turns out that actually uh, for many uh, trust negotiations, um, it might be very useful to have anonymous negotiation. Also because a subject may not, uh, a subject may not want different negotiation to be linked it, with him. So he, to, to reach this non-linkability, uh, or to reach to this non-linkability requirement, we do need to have uh, some protocols or some mechanism to ensure that every single nego negotiation is anonymous. This is, for instance, the case uh, in uh, like in bidding auctions or uh, other contests where the, the, the identity of the user is not really important because in most of the times, uh, what the really the other party is interested in while negotiating is not the actual identity of the user, but it's just uh, some properties that are not necessarily related with the identity. So in order to address the issue of anonymity in, uh, in the trust negotiations, we first have to define and to clearly understand which are, the, which are the identifiers, which are the information, the attributes that actually cause identity disclosure. So we defined these two different uh, concepts. First, the concepts of identifier, and in the second, the quasi-identifier group, uh, groups. These terms are, are uh, borrowed from some work on anonymity, and there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of overlapping concepts from our work with that work. The main difference is that in that work, they work in a database environment, while here we are in a, we, we are in open, we are dealing with open environments, so there are other issues that have to be considered. So by the way, this uh, um, concept of identifier is, uh, is simply, an identifier is simply a single concept, a single attribute that uh, uniquely identify a user, while a quasi-identifier group is basically a combination of attributes of, uh, uh, and then of concepts if we consider it under the under the, um, at, at the higher, le higher level perspective, uh, the, a combination of uh, concepts that uh, uniquely identify the user. So um, anonymity preserving disclosures means that um, no identifier in, uh, in uh, each of the disclosure set that have to be disclosed during the negotiations contain an identifier. And even if a quasi-identifier group need to be, need to be disclosed, at least one of the quasi-identifier is missing. So we need to work again on this um, disclosure set and see whether we can modify the disclosure set in order to make it anonymous. If we, if, if we found out that either an identifier or a quasi-identifier group is revealed. So we adopt two different techniques. One is, called, is the substitution, and the other one is the, is the generalization. So starting with the substitution, supposed to have uh, a disclosure set. And the disclosure set, uh, as I said earlier, is, is there's a combination of attributes that need to be disclosed in order to, to satisfy a given policy. Supposed to have uh, um, um, the attribute ID age and the attribute ID country in a, in a disclosure set. And suppose that, uh, for instance, that the ID age is a requested attribute while ID country is an unrequested one. So we want to, to hide um, ID country, but uh, because, it, uh, because, it cause, uh, because it causes uh, um, revealing of anonymity since it belongs, we assume that it belongs to a given quasi-identifier group. And we want to hide it. But in order to replace it, uh, we also need to, to, to hide the ID age. Here, this is because I am in here assuming that, I'm, uh, that uh, the privacy enhanced credential scheme is not always available. So if I have to hide uh, an attribute, uh, the attribute country, since it belongs to the, attribute, uh, to the credential ID, I also have to hide all the attributes that are, uh, that are in the same, uh, that are in the same uh, credential. Or it might also happen that I actually do have a, 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 credential, a, a, a privacy enhanced credential, but not all, the, not all of the attributes can be blinded. And ID country is one of the attributes that cannot be blinded. So to preserve anonymity, what I do is first try to, 
to, to, to suppress uh, the attribute country. And if you have, uh, in the, in, and if in order to do that, I also have to, I also have to hide the, the attributes age, I might end up not uh, satisfying the policy because, uh, because uh, ID age was a, a required attribute. So what I do is to replace, uh, to substitute the attribute ID age with an equivalent one. For instance, the date of birth. And this I can do it easily since I can rely on, on my ontology and the ontology tells me which are the equivalent, uh, which are the equivalent attributes and how to map a given attribute in a, uh, a given attribute in, a, in, another, in another one. And if there are any condition, I can also check you, you, using the translation function that I mentioned if the same, if the same condition is, is, uh, is verified. Regarding instead the other techniques that we adopted, that was the generalization technique, we rely on the use of a specific data structure, which is called, um, which is called uh, uh, concept graph. And this is an acyclic graph. And the idea is that to, is to organize different concepts that, that the user has uh, in, a, in a using a generalization, in a, in a generalization um, uh, relationship. So, uh, this, con this uh, concept is used uh, for, uh, for the generalization technique. And how is it used? Suppose to have, um, uh, so suppose that ID address is a requested attribute and causes an identity disclosure. So as, as similarly as uh, we do in the substitution, we replace the attribute with another one which, is, uh, which does, does not cause identity disclosure. But if we cannot, um, sub substituted with an equivalent one because the, at the, the, co the attribute itself need to be disclosed to satisfy the policy. The only thing that you can do is to generalize it, to give a more general one and hope that uh, a, more general attribute, uh, a more general attribute will anyhow be accepted by the counterpart to satisfy the policy. So in this case, if I have, idea, I, I have the address, I'll, go, I'll check if, I have, if there exists uh, and um, a more general concept for the, con for, uh, for the, for the concept address and um, see if I have any attributes that uh, are mapped into this uh, more general concept that is, in this case, is CT. So this is a, just an example. This is just an example on how it, it, all this process works. So we have a, a disclosure policy and two different, uh, two different disclosure sets that can both satisfy our, um, our policy. Of course, uh, a, privacy uh, a privacy conscious uh, subject will also always try to, 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 to submit the, the, the smallest set. So it will try first to, to, to to, um, it will try first to, to submit the, the, the second disclosure set, but if it cannot, then, then it will uh, disclose the other set. And uh, eventually, if it's required, it will run one of those two protocols to preserve anonymity of the user. So uh, these were like the first, uh, the first work, that, uh, the initial work that we did, we did uh, uh, on the anonymity. Of course, it, mm, these these protocols are kind of uh, are are not as straightforward as they might seem because there are a lot of issues that are related with anonymity when dealing in, when uh, we dealing with open environments like. Uh, uh, like those in which trust negotiations take place. First, we need to exactly identify which are the quasi the identifier and the quasi identifier groups that actually identify a user. And this is not as trivial as it was, uh, as trivial as simple as it was uh, in the database environments where you actually have a table, you have the the structure of the table, and you can identify easily which are the information that actually cause identity disclosure. Um, Further, the other, um, the other problem that we have, and we need to, come, we need to deal with a given context, because uh, anon anonymity makes sense if I cannot distinguish a subject within a given context, but we don't really have a clear notion of context in our, in our trust negotiation environment. So let's keep this as example. So we have a, 
consider, consider the example of a student who is the only, the only French student in the chemistry department. Or now, the, the, the property nationality and the property department uh, affiliation is not always uh, revealing identity. But it might be if the user is a particular user which has particular values for that, uh, for that, uh, for that attributes. So in this case, uh, uh, we do have identity disclosure, and it's very difficult to detect it by analyzing simply the name, the attribute name, uh, the attribute name. So the user might not, uh, the, the trust negotiation party might not have considered them as uh, as um, as quasi part of a quasi identifier groups because it was not really considering the the environment in which the trust negotiation was actually taking place. So we do have to say that the, the anonymity preserving disclosure may not always guarantee anonymity. So what we can do in this sense to address this issue is we need to assign uh, to each disclosure set a degree of anonymity safety, which means that we want to have, uh, we want to uh, come up with a notion which is similar to the canonymity notion that uh, the canonymity works. So the idea is to have, um, the idea is to have any other K subjects in a given group that do, ha do have the same disclosure set. So we do have an, we have a disclosure set, and we want to be sure that every time that this disclosure set is, re is, is released, uh, there are other K other subjects which have the exactly the same disclosure set with the same values. And this uh, satisfies our, our notion of can canonymity safety. So these are other uh, projects that we were working on and are uh, not, not only related with the, pri with the privacy anonymity, but still there are a lot of aspects to be considered also in, uh, related with privacy in these. First is about the mobile negotiations. So another exten uh, an extension that we are doing, we are trying to make this uh, algorithm to apply these systems and uh, our algorithm in uh, a, a mobile environment, which means that we want to have, we, we possibly want to have um, negotiations carried out by, by moving peers, a peer which are, for instance, connected through laptop, uh, through, through PDAs or other, or other moving objects. Then another important uh, area that we are currently explore, exploring is, re is related with the federated identity management and the trust negotiations within uh, uh, federations. So there are a lot of uh, similarities. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of sim similarities between uh, trust negotiation paradigm and the federated identity. And the two, approach, the two approaches can be well integrated to obtain, to obtain, and, and, uh, to, 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 to obtain a, an efficient management of the fed, of identities of identities of the users. And also, we can exploit the, tr the trust negotiation techniques within the federation to exchange. Uh, uh, to exchange uh, data, services, or uh, any, any other information. And our, um, our trust negotiation techniques uh, can also be used uh, to prevent uh, some form of identity theft. OK, I guess I'm done. This is it. These are some references of the work we've been working on. And Actually, I have a quick question about the, which are exactly the difference of, of your approach with respect to database for instance, for the anonymity stuff. You mean it's the structure with, the, with this different exactly, right? So you, what you have is a sort of a semi-structured data, or uh, you have some partial information on the schema that you have instead in a database, you know exactly. Well, the main difference is that uh, we, don't, we can't rely on the analysis of the database like on the content of the database. We don't have this, the information of the possible tables, the possible uh, attribute fields that you might have. So we don't have this, uh, we don't have knowledge or, of which are the, for instance, the keys, the identifiers, the post-identifiers. We need to 
to detect them somehow, but we don't really have any reference, uh, uh, any, any data to refer to. Because the idea is that if the negotiation it comes, is executed in a totally open environment, you don't, as a, as, a negotiate, as a party, you don't have knowledge about the previous negotiation that your counterpart has carried on. So you don't really know if he already has like other um, information of the same type of different users. Or if it, or if it has, we are not really every we are not making any assumption on the fact that any any user is actually keeping track of previous negotiations with other or with the same identities. There is no really linkage between different negotiations. 